A one is not a pseudocyst. And even today, the two often get confused. We should follow the revised Atlanta classification from 2012. Differentiates four types of pancreatic fluid collections. We have acute fluid collections that develop from interstitial pancreatitis, and if they persist for more than four weeks and develop a mature wall, they become pseudocysts. These contain fluid only. Acute necrotic collections develop from necrotizing pancreatitis. If they persist for more than four weeks and develop a mature wall, we call these walled off necroses. They contain fluid and necroses. So this differentiation is very important and CT is very poor at making this differentiation. A study showed that an MRI has significantly greater sensitivity in detecting solid debris. So you see here the hyperintense signal for liquid and the low intensity for solid on the MRI. There are, of course, other advantages to using MRI over CT. We can see the pancreatic and biliary anatomy. We can see vessels, evaluate for pseudoaneurysm. There's no radiation, ionizing radiation, and no contrast nephrotoxicity. The ESGE in 2019 recommends that we obtain a MRI, ideally with secretin-enhanced MRCP, before endoscopic drainage of, of pancreatic fluid collections. The four-week rule has become the standard of care. Now, the rationale for that is that we want to allow the fluid collection to wall off and the contents to liquefy. But we must recognize that this rule is rooted in the surgical literature from an era of surgical necrosectomy. A randomized controlled trial showed that the mortality and the morbidity was significantly reduced if we waited more than four weeks before performing surgical, open surgical necrosectomy. And hence, the rule. Also, 42% of acute fluid collections resolve spontaneously within six weeks. Now, we don't know how many of these actually had necroses. So the question is, does this four-week rule also apply for endoscopy? This is a study from the University of Minnesota, and they looked at their patients that had endoscopic-centered uh, interventions early, less than four weeks, and compared that with patients that had the standard protocol after four weeks. And what they found is that the mortality and the morbidity was significantly higher in those patients who underwent early intervention. However, these patients were much sicker. 91% of the patients that had early intervention had infected necroses. And they also had significantly greater kidney injury, respiratory failure, and shock. So it's actually not surprising that the mortality and morbidity was higher in the early group. When they looked at organ failure outcomes, they found that for all groups, whether performed early or late, there was a significant improvement in the organ failure outcomes, renal, pulmonary, and shock. So all of these, as you can see here in the, in the bars, improve significantly. So it really doesn't matter when you do the intervention. These patients benefit from the intervention. Also, interestingly, procedure complications did not differ whether performed early or late. There was no increased procedure-related complication when performed early. And in fact, there was a higher perforation risk in the group that had late intervention, which is surprising because we would expect poor adherence of the cyst to the wall when performed uh, early. So let's turn now to WAN management. I'm going to break it down to these four categories. Access. We can use the Seldinger technique, 
This is the time-honored technique that we inherited or that we borrowed from our radiology colleagues. We puncture, we place a guide wire, and we dilate the tract for access. The non-Seldinger technique eliminates the guide wire. It is exchange-free. We puncture, and then we immediately deploy the lambs for access to the cyst. When you use the Seldinger technique, it is a multi-step technique, and each of these steps carries some risk. When we advance a device over the wire, when we insert it into the cyst, we may get perforation or we may get uh, displacement of the cavity if it's not firmly adherent. When we remove a device over the wire, we may get leak or perforation. So we should consider using a non-Seldinger technique, eliminate over the guide wire exchanges if there is indeterminate adherence. And the criteria for that in my practice are, if there's a cyst wall distance that's greater than 10 millimeters, you can see that here, an echogenic layer, that's fat, between the cyst and the wall, that indicates non-adherence or poor adherence, or if the cyst moves independent from the wall when you apply pressure to the abdomen. Now drainage. So we use, we've used double pigtail stents. Historically, more recently, we're using metal stents, both the conventional tubular, but also now lambs. This is a meta-analysis looking at five large studies, almost 600 patients. And what this showed was that if we looked at, look at overall resolution, there is a significantly better outcome when using the metal stents, both the conventional tubular and the lambs. If we look at number of procedures to achieve resolution, here too, the metal stents were superior to the plastic stents. However, a US randomized controlled trial from Florida showed none superiority of lambs over plastic stents for drainage of wands. No significant difference in success, hospital stay, total procedure, readmits, and the lambs actually had more advance, uh, adverse events, 32% versus 70%. Many of these were bleeds, though these bleeds were found to occur after three weeks when the lambs were left in for longer than three weeks. Lambs were understandably more expensive the only advantage of using a lambs was that it was quicker. So it was less than half of the time to drain the cyst compared to plastic stents. Now I call your attention to this down here. If we compare plastic and lambs, there is a nearly, there is a threefold increased use of nasal cister catheter, uh, catheter drainage or irrigation, as well as percutaneous drainage in the plastic stent group. So we need to consider this as a potentially confounding variable here that can affect outcomes. What is the best practice advice from the AGA? Number nine states, self-expanding metal stents in the form of lambs appear to be superior to plastic stents for endoscopic transmural drainage of necroses. So they're recommending that we use lambs. But obviously, we need more randomized controlled trials. And there are two on the way now, one from Spain and the other from China. Many open questions. Plastic stents, I place three, but is that better than two? And is, are two better really than one? It's never been uh, proven. Metal stents is bigger, better. Is a 20 millimeter better than a 15? Should we use dual pathway, the multi-gate? If so, when? Should it be based on size of the cyst? Should we place the double pigtail within the lambs? Uh, will this reduce the adverse events such as uh, bleeding and stent occlusion? We don't have the answer to that yet. Turn to debridement now. So debridement can be divided into indirect and direct. So with indirect, we are irrigating and we are draining, and this can be performed, performed endoscopically with a nasal cystic catheter with irrigation or a percutaneous catheter. For direct, we can go with our endoscope directly into 
this cavity, the cyst, and we can perform necrosectomy. Surgically, this could be done laparoscopically or with the VARD procedure, video-assisted um, retroperitoneal debridement. The advantage of a LAMS for direct debrid debridement is that we can use the LAMS as a port to perform necrosectomy. So this would be an advantage over plastic stents as well as the conventional tubular metal stent. Many open questions remain. For indirect debridement, what's the best solution? Should we add hydrogen peroxide? Should we add an antibiotic? Should this be continuous or in intervals? In terms of the irrigation, what's the flow rate, the best flow rate? How long should we irrigate? For direct, we're borrowing tools off the shelf. We've used baskets, nets, forceps, snares, morselators. So what's the best tool? And when should we start necrosectomy? Should it be at the index procedure or only when irrigation fails? We'll talk about that in a moment. And how aggressive should we be? Should we try to get all the necroses out in a single session? The step-up concept, this is the emerging paradigm shift introduced by the Dutch Pancreatitis Study Group. Step one is we start with indirect debridement. So we drain and irrigate. This can be done percutaneously or endoscopically. Step two is direct only if needed. So then we proceed to necrosectomy. Again, this could be surgically or endoscopically. The tension trial was published two years ago. It is a Dutch multicentered trial, and they compared endoscopic step-up with surgical step-up. So you can see that for the patient undergoing endoscopic treatment, they place two plastic stents and perform nasal cystic catheter irrigation. It's very important to note that. And then proceeded to necrosectomy only if that failed. For the surgical group, they started with percutaneous irrigation, and they only went to VARD necrosectomy if that failed. What they found is that nearly half of the patients in both groups had a resolution of their wands just with irrigation alone. That means half the patients were spared having to undergo necrosectomy. And then favoring endoscopic drainage, and this is expected, fewer pancreatic fistulas, and shorter hospital stay. The MISER trial is a U.S. multicenter trial. This compares endoscopic step up, but this is a different step up from the Dutch trial versus surgery. They're using minimally invasive surgery, either laparoscopic or VARD, for necrotizing pancreatitis. So it's all comers, not just infected. And here they only perform drainage, no irrigation. So I want to emphasize that no irrigation, it's just drainage. And only if that failed did they go to necrosectomy. Now, what's interesting is that 44% failed drainage alone. That means 66% had resolution with drainage alone. And that's quite remarkable. So that means the majority of patients actually can be treated uh, adequately with just drainage. No difference in mortality between the two groups and favoring endoscopic drainage, fewer major complications, lower cost expected, better quality of life expected. Our best practice advice number 10 from the AGA, direct endoscopic necrosectomy should be reserved for those patients with limited necroses who do not adequately respond to endoscopic transmural drainage. So they have embraced the step up concept. Post-procedure care, just one slide, because we really have only anecdotal data. We don't have randomized controlled trials, maybe with one exception, and that is we should not use parenteral nutrition. We should use enteral nutrition because of a higher risk of lawn infection. But we don't know when we should start the diet and what we should be feeding the patient. Prophylactic antibiotics and non-infected cysts or wands, how long should we uh, treat with antibiotics? Should we discontinue PPI? Some argue that will facilitate the debridement. Others argue it increases the risk of bleeding. Reimaging when and tied in with that question is when should we remove the stent, especially the lambs. And right now, I think most are following the three-week rule, but that still needs to be studied further. So my take-home messages, firstly, imaging, 
obtain an MRI prior to drainage to quantify solid debris. That should become the new standard. Timing of drainage, sick patients benefit from earlier drainage. If your patient is sick, that four-week rule shouldn't really dominate. Indeterminate wall adherence, if you suspect that, then consider an exchange-free access um, technique. And if you're going to do a necrosectomy, do it translams. And for debridement, you start indirect and you step up to direct only if needed. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the honor of giving the Gene and Lynn Overholt lecture.